Welcome to Leadership Talk, the official Waymaker podcast, the place for conversations about leadership, strategy, and technology that help make business improvement business as usual. Welcome to Leadership Talk, the official Waymaker podcast. I'm your host, Craig. With me, sucking back on some sort of green tea, I'm assuming, is Stuart Leo, founder and CEO of Waymaker. How are you, Stu? I'm fantastic. It's uh, black tea. Uh, yeah. Black tea with a little little hint of sugar. Right. Uh, which is a bit dangerous, but it's wonderful. Stu. Um, <clears throat> by, by, by the, by yeah. the, before you go any further, yeah. the official Waymaker podcast. It's yeah. like we've got imitators out there. It's like don't <laughs> <laughs> don't listen. That's don't true. Listen. Don't listen to them. <laughs> don't listen to them. Seriously. This is the only way make a podcast. We've been talking off air about scammers, and like we just wanted to reinforce the fact that this is this actually is the, the only official. one that you should be That's listening right. to, which may be disappointing for some people. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! You mean dear. there's not a better one out there? <laughs> oh dear. Wouldn't it be well, bad? hey, Stu, this is your third microphone in three weeks, and partly, <laughs> partly because. <laughs> partly because you've moved offices, right? <laughs> that is correct. Yes. <laughs> it's like, um, <laughs> anyway, come on. Yes, it is my third <laughs> microphone in three weeks. All but right, well, let's it, hear is it. Is it working? Is it all right? Yeah. Sound all right? No, that's fine. A little bit closer, maybe. Okay, is that better? Uh, yeah, that's good. All right. All right. And, um, okay, great. And, mm. Stu, just to test it out, perhaps you can give us a bit of a recap on the last couple of weeks before <laughs> we dive into leadership posture number two. Uh, yes, yeah. So we've, we've been talking about the, uh, the leadership postures required to find the breakthrough moments and build the leadership capabilities and competencies throughout the journey. So, yep. Right back to basics, the leadership curve gets you started on the bottom left of the curve at ideation, moving through identity and market fit to calibration and team building and skills and systems to maturity where you're expanding the organisation to mastery where you're leading the market and transforming how people live and work. And um, uh, our view is that uh, it's not about being one type of leader, hey, you're the courageous leader or the servant leader or whatever label you want to put on your leadership style but rather at those different stages of organizational growth uh, you need to take a certain posture of leadership Mm -hmm. and 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 that posture changes according to those stages and that posture or that stage requires certain uh, must do actions, it has certain risks and rewards and certain outcomes that you'll accomplish through your leadership that all cumulatively build up to becoming you know, a leader like Craig, uh, <laughs> a, an inspirational, transformative, um, <laughs> masterful leader. Um, come on. Uh, come on. <laughs> um, and so the, uh, the journey here is about five types, f- sorry, five postures of leadership. Yeah. Uh, the curious leader, uh, which is, is the ideation stage. The persistent leader, which is finding market fit and identity. Uh, the empowering leader, which is growing team skills and systems. The wise leader, where you're expanding the organisation as you hit maturity. Uh, and the inspirational leader, where you're transforming how people live, work, do stuff. Great. And so in this episode, we wanted to focus particularly on the persistent leader, which is about finding market fit, which is almost sometimes feels like finding a unicorn. Correct. Yeah, well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you find the unicorn and become the unicorn. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the big idea, isn't that's it? That's the but- goal and the mission of, of everyone at this stage of business growth. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're in business. Yeah. Um, the, you know, this is the... Um, we're Stu also- and I were tossing a coin about whether or not we should have a nap <laughs> or, or record this podcast. podcast. <laughs> Which one's more persistent? <laughs> But if it's a good a good phase to talk about it, yeah, <laughs> at one thirty in the afternoon. Correct. Yeah. It's yeah. Siesta straight time. after lunch. Um, All right. So, so it's, we will be persistent. How about? All right. Where you go, mate. So yeah, let's talk about the persistent leader then. So there are certain, uh, like you say, there are certain must do actions, risks and rewards, and learning outcomes uh, mm. that we can associate with the persistent leader. Firstly, let's talk about 
let's maybe deep dive a little bit more into this idea of market fit, mm. finding market fit. Mm. Mm. Do you want an answer? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the answer to finding market fit uh, is elusive, and mm. I'm hesitant to put too much of a detailed definition on it. Rather, because I don't think anybody has, and I think if the moment you do, you might find that it's not 100% watertight. Yeah. Um, you know, some people uh, will describe market fit as that moment when suddenly the business blows up in a good way around you, and it's like, where did all those transactions come from? Mm. Uh, you know, you wake up the next morning and you've gone viral and Kim Kardashian's wearing your tote bag, you know, that kind of moment. Um, uh, it, it's that moment when suddenly the market says, oh, where have you been our whole lives? We have a problem that you solve. Mm-hmm. And, and so finding that market fit is actually, it's more than, than awareness. You know, often it's, it's catalyzed by a moment like a, you know, what I jokingly just said there with a, when mm. it, where a Kim Kardashian wears your tote bag kind of moment, uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, but really, there's a whole bunch of things that are working behind the scenes uh, that you've been working on so that when that moment happens, whether it's triggered by a celebrity or an or a ad campaign that worked or a product feature that just came out and suddenly it sinks, it doesn't blow the business up. It's not like Kim Kardashian where you use your tote bag and everybody goes to your website and your e-commerce site crashes. No, it works. It sustains mm. the volume and it has the right customer journey and people buy and your processing works and uh, your fulfillment works and your warehousing's working and all everything about the business is working and your employees turn up the next day and stick tote bags in cardboard mm-hmm. boxes and make it work. You know, it's so finding market fit is. I want to say it's a little bit elusive, but I think it's a combination of getting six things right, okay. ish, right ish. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they don't they don't need to be perfect; they just need to fit. Okay, which um, you know, I I, I um, I'm not blessed with a body like um, Chris <laughs> Hemsworth. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, thanks for laughing, Craig. And you know, sometimes I put a jacket you on. Pretty, pretty much, just pick any. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so you know, sometimes you put a jacket on. This yeah. is a, this is so gone off the rails so this fast. This is awesome. Uh, you know, I put a jacket on, and it's not perfect, but it fits, right? Yeah. Um, might need to lose a pound or two, um, bulk up. The chest, um, somehow in my 40s, my chest moved down 20 centimetres. <laughs> uh, you know, but it fits. It's not perfect, but it fits. Um, and that's kind of what market fit is. It's not perfect, but it fits. Enough of the market has said you solve the problem we're looking for and the systems and the skills and the structures you've built to date are, are enough to sustain that demand. You fit. Right. Uh, yep. You found a fit. Yep. And so I think there's six things, um, and you don't have to be perfect at any of these, but you've, these are sort of the six edges of the hexagon that need to fit in the hexagon-shaped hole to find that fit. That is clarity of purpose, uh-huh. um, and that comes out of question one in the, six, the seven questions. So if you've got clarity of purpose, you've got clarity of problem. And if you've got clarity of problem, then you know, you're, you're solving a problem that exists in the marketplace. The second mm-hmm. one is perceptions. People think and believe about you what you need them to think and believe about you for the problem you solve. Yep. So uh, you, you go, oh, man, I've got this problem. I need a brand new tote bag. Oh, wow, Kim Kardashian's got that fancy new tote bag. Hey, that's from Brand X. Awesome. Aren't they amazing? I'm thinking the right things. I go to Brand X and buy. Bad example, but I think you get what I'm putting down. So purpose, perceptions. Second is position in market. You know, that you've got the right position or aspiring to the right position. People look at your, your business and go, yeah, that's, that fits me. Um, uh, I want to buy from them or buy that product. It's positioned correctly for me. 
um, what are you up to? One, two, three, four. Um, you'll notice these are all P's. Uh, the fourth one is um, practices and value proposition. So practices and proposition. So the, the practices are we're doing the right things in the business model. Mm-hmm. So we've got the fit in the business model, and that's creating the right proposition, value proposition to the customer. Um, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just right-ish. Um, fifthly, the personality and the experience I have of interacting with this business um, is a fit. Uh, if I'm buying a premium product, but it's a two-cent store personality, there's going to be dissonance and it's not going to fit. So we've got mm-hmm. the personality of the customer experience right. And sixthly, we've got the principles of our culture right. We've got the foundations of teamwork right. Um, again, nothing's perfect, but it's enough of a fit. Some of those may be more overbalanced depending on the product or service than others. But if it's a combination of those six things, we've got enough of those six things right to go, ah, we've found a fit. There's something working here. And then we're beginning to break through and move out of the market fit stage. The net benefit of all of those things, fitting is obviously cash flow, transactions, traction, all of those wonderful things. Yeah. But to find all of those, um, you've got to be persistent. You kind of got to be a, can I say this, a hard ass. You got to just like, you got to say, yeah, we're recording a podcast at 1.30 at siesta time. <laughs> Let's get in and do it. Um, uh, not that that's hard. Um, I think the emphasis there on persistent leader, though, um, is maybe accentuated by this idea of finding market fit because Correct. this stage is all about the process of finding. Yes. It's not It's not because we move on to other stages in the ca- calibration stage and the maturity stage and the mastery stage, but this stage is about finding which is why we emphasize persistent yes yeah thank you for clarifying that that's that's true you will you when you have market fit you've left this stage so in order to get through this stage it's it's that persistence of going yeah i i i I, we haven't got we haven't got the journey right let's rework the customer journey or man we haven't got our culture right we've got staff turnover let's fix some things what you know what do we stand for or, hey, we haven't quite nailed the problem yet. Um, uh, we've got to narrow down on that. Or, yeah, we're kind of in the right market, but we haven't nailed the ideal customer yet. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all the shaping and the refining of that fit. It's like a Rubik's Cube, right? You get the blue side out, but then you screw up the yellow side and <laughs> you yeah, can tweak it, right? It's exactly. just that constant yeah, uh, yeah, correction. Which is, it's actually, um, you know, it's, it's, it's finding the effective solutions to the problems you're facing to find the fit. Yep. So it's a time when you don't have money. You know, nobody really wants to give you money in finding market fit. They uh-huh. kind of want to give you money after market fit. Yep. Um, Prove more yourself than, and then we'll back you. That's yep. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and you look at, you look at um, capital investment um, charts and, you know, it's friends, families and fools that have put money mm. in, in in ideation and finding market fit. Um, but it's venture capitalists that want to drop mm. in just as you found it because you're going you're gonna to start 10xing on a compounding rate once you've found that fit. It's a, so you, your job here is to be persistent and to kind of great. You know, you're grinding gears. It's not mm. fun. It's, mm. it, it's sucky kind of time, but yeah. you've got to be persistent. It's Most work. people that are pitching to Shark Tank have, have gone through this stage. Yeah, in fact, <laughs> that's what stage. Shark Tank, yeah, you know, the Shark Tanks are looking for that, aren't they? They're, yeah. they're like, okay, well, what's the, they'll be asking questions like, um, what's the cost to acquire a customer? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, because you would have proven that you can go and find a customer for, let's call it $50 if it's a, maybe a $1,000 product, and you can consistently repeat that. Ah, uh, that's 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 fit. We've now got fit in customer acquisition. They might say, "Okay, um, tell us about your business model. Um, uh, how do you know that you're creating value for your customer? You know what proves that they're going to they're going to come back and buy?" And you might go, "Oh, actually, well, thirty percent of our customers come back and buy for a second time within twelve weeks." 
yeah. okay, yeah. that's fit. You know, so they're you can that's I think the Shark Tank's a great example. They're asking questions to go, uh, am I placing a bet on somebody still trying to figure it out? Or am I placing a bet on somebody that's figured out and they just need my connections and my money to yep. scale this thing? Yep. Yep. So what are some of the rewards then, Stu, in the uh, market fit stage in the um, identity? We call this the identity growth stage, but yeah, what, what are some of the rewards in well, that space? Um, and and that we don't title this stage market fit. We title it identity, which is kind of funny. Okay. It's, a, it's a bit yep. different to, to other journeys. And I'll tell you why. Because... This is kind of one of those stages where you find yourself uh, from mm-hmm. an organization perspective, not necessarily from, a, from an individual perspective. You find who you are as an organization and the role you play within the market you're operating in, which is kind of exciting. You know, when, yep. when, when you kind of find yourself, um, it's, there's a real sense of joy and purpose and affirmation and clarity that kind of comes from that moment yep. where it's like, hey, I exist for this reason. Hmm. People want me to exist because they have value from me. I have a sense of purpose in this world. And I'm, I'm saying <laughs> I, but it's really we have a sense of purpose in this world. Yeah. You know, how, when you meet somebody that's found their sense of identity and purpose in the world, they're, they're like, it's like the lights have gone on. They're switched on. There's something different about them, isn't there? Mm, mm. It's it's kind of exciting. You you kind of want to be around them because there's an there's an energy and an excitement and a passion and 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 so the biggest reward of this stage is you get to find yourself if I can put it in that language. Mm-hmm. Most importantly, you get to find your customers who help you find you. And and remember, it's an organisational context. Yeah. So those rewards are uh, deep and meaningful. And they, there's not necessarily always a cash payback at this point. You, you may, you've seen some cash come in, but you, you may not even be trading profitably at this point. Hmm. Uh, you're still probably burning runway, but you've now got confidence to go, it's no longer does this or could this business exist. It's how big can we make this business? Yeah, great. So, um, Stu, uh, rewards. Let's talk about the risks then. In the same phase, yeah. Um, well, they're pretty obvious. So, <laughs> the the big risk is fear of failure. Yes, yeah. this is this is where so many people um, fall down because they see failure as a negative, not failure as a learning moment. Yeah, and you know, if take your your Rubik's cube exa- Rubik's cube example, if mm. at every turn you went, oh, failed, I can't do it, uh, and you didn't take another turn you would never solve the Rubik's Cube. But if at every turn you go, ah, that didn't work or that did work, that's a learning moment, then after 50 turns you might solve the Rubik's Cube. You'll find yep. fit. So yep. this is why uh, so many tech mantras, startup mantras are well, failure is the best option or failure is a way forward or what was Mark Zuckerberg's great um, – quote you know products don't come out completed um you have an idea you launch it you break it you fix it you break it you fix it keep breaking it mm. and uh and and the, the point here is you're you're just refining so fear of failure is the big one if you can't handle failure you will not get through this stage yeah um, what's that book by chip and dan heath around success failing? success it's called success yeah it's called success right. uh um and it's, the, it's a little acronym for yeah. – um, actually, it may not be. Uh, ideas that stick was the success model. Um, do you remember that? Yeah, okay. I know that one. I, I, just, I, was, I thought there was one around failure, but – Well, you know what? Could be wrong. Um, we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll ask up. our team. Um, <laughs> our team at Google. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and – uh, <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. All right. Um, okay, right. All right. So if you, you, you talk, I'll ask. Okay. Because <laughs> you know what? Um, I can't talk and Google at the same time because <laughs> I Googled chip death, death failure. Um, yeah, right. Which okay, is, don't do that. Yeah. No, so, let, me get, let me get back to the topic. So, so more, fear of failure. Yeah, yeah fear of another, failure. Another, another risk? 
obviously off that inaction, um, you stall. Uh, mm. You don't because you're, you're too afraid to take action, which more often than not will lead to failure, by the way. Uh-huh. Like this yeah. is the, the kind of the, the moment, isn't it? It's you, you realise that if you do 10 things today, eight or nine of them might be a failure. And that's not a great feeling. And if you don't get over that, okay, they're not failures, they're learning moments, then you never actually get to the point where you can get it from eight or nine things that are failures down to two or three. Um, so that causes inaction. And you've just got to, you know, shift that mindset. Um, so uh, arrogance, this is where mm. pride and arrogance can creep in. Um, as founders we and leaders, we often think we know best. And so it's a case of, well, hey, I thought, no, I, this, is what, this is the problem. This is what the solution. This is why you're going to want to buy this. But you talk to 10 customers and seven of them say differently. And if you're not humble enough to listen um, and you let pride and arrogance get in the way of that, you're going to fail, mm. um, which you know, leads to that next, you know, not listening. Um, you've just got to shut up and listen at this point. You've got to do, you've got to fail, you've got to listen, you've got to repeat. And uh, it sounds really hard because it is really hard. Yeah. Uh, the number of businesses that fail because they don't find market fit or they don't scale because they don't find the right kind of market fit um, yeah. uh, is astronomical. So this is the hardest stage to get through, which is why you won't get funded or invested in or supported until you've found market fit. How good is it to work with an organisation or a company, though, that actually is humble enough to take feedback on board at this stage of yeah. the growth cycle? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's great. Um, it's really humbling because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have an idea, <clears throat> and I'll just speak from personal experience. Yeah. Um, you have an idea and you think the idea is amazing. Um, and so you go and prototype it or put it out to market and you play with it. and Pretty quickly, you know, over the course of weeks and months, you realise that the idea was not great. Um, it was kind of pretty ordinary, yeah. but actually the, the idea starts to transform and morph. You let the idea kind of grow and shape and, and the idea moves from good to great to amazing to, wow, could this really happen? Mm. And, and that's actually the exciting part of that journey. Um, yeah. So, um, so the big the big risks around this stage are fear of failure, leading to inaction, possibly triggered by arrogance and not listening. You know, they're the yeah. things you've got to look out for. Cool, it's pretty cool, cool. pretty humbling stage. Yeah. So, but there are some learning outcomes. There are some there are some wins. From, yes. From this from this stage. So, what are some of those, to you? So, as as part of your leadership journey, you know, becoming a better you. Um, uh, you, you actually, and, and I should have said this right at the start, in the ideations phase, you're leading yourself. You're on yep. your own. Um, yep. When you move into market fit, you are actually starting to lead others. So, um, you know, that, that was a pretty big point I missed right at the start. You know, lead yourself in, as a curious leader. Lead others as a persistent leader. You've actually got to move at least one or two or three others to a stage of market fit. Sometimes it's yeah. more, sometimes it's less. So, and, and, and because they're not quite as persistent as you are because they don't yet believe in what it is that you've... Yeah, you know, you, you know you're yeah. the, you are the leader. You're the one yeah. that goes, okay, I, I'm going to die in a ditch over this. We yeah. are not... And that's not saying, right, we're working through till 2 a.m. and don't you dare yeah. go home. It's not that kind of thing. It's, it's the... It's the persistence to say we have a problem to solve at this stage of our journey. Yeah, we are just going to persist, and we, if that means failing for six months, we're going to fail for six months. That's the that's what yeah. we're talking about. And the big outcomes is that you're going to learn to problem solve well as a team. Yeah, you're you're going to learn some disciplines of, of a team. Everybody says that if you're part of a startup team or a foundational team, there's something magical that happens. And that magical thing is that journey of going, we, we, we saw the mountain, we were afraid of the mountain, we climbed the mountain, 
and we got back down and we conquered the mountain. And people that go on those journeys, there's a, there's a bond. There's a, there's a brotherly, sisterly bond through those moments where you go, you, you know, hey, we had those bet your company moments. We had that. We faced that day when we all went, uh-oh, there's $2 left in the bank account. You know, how are we going to do this? Or, mm. or the platform that we were working on decided to go bust and we've got to replatform 50 customers or, um, you know, so, think, of, think of the worst problems you could ever have and you're going to have them. Um, uh, they, hap- they happen. And so you get this team discipline emerging, this yep. – this this amazing teamwork framing, which you've got to bottle, you've got to you've got to take in to the next journey because the people you're leading now, um, you led yourself. Now you're leading others. Our next stage is that those people you're leading today are the leaders of tomorrow. So this is the training ground of the next generation of leaders, mm-hmm. and and they need to carry that through. So. So you're going to get a lot of great customer insights, a great a lot of great employee and team insights, and you're going to learn how to do goal management really well because you're going to set good goals. You're going to go, we, we hypothesize that we can achieve this. Okay, yeah. these are the outcomes that, that determine that. Okay, well, we didn't or we did. Uh, you know, you're going to do goal management really well because of that continuous improvement cycle. So, yeah. It's a, it's a really, really tough stage because you are breaking the back of the business, of the organisation. Yep. You, you're getting to that point where you go, yeah, this is real. Yeah, you're asking all the questions about the excited version of you in the curiosity stage. <laughs> but yeah. you know, what were you thinking? <laughs> it, yeah. is, it is definitely the hardest of the five, five stages. Yeah, uh, yeah, look, they all have their own kind of hard elements but i I Mm. think this bit is because this bit sets you up for financial success it doesn't guarantee it um it it's so hard Mm. and um and you know there's something special that you've got to bring to the table to get there you've got to be a little bit crazy you know you've got to channel that steve jobs we are the crazy ones he he was so good um at this stage at at, at helping larger groups of people believe in a vision when that vision wasn't quite right putting out products i mean he's putting out products that are version 1.0 that are not quite right but he's going no 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 we're the crazy ones stick with us there's that wonderful clip we should find it and slice it in at this point where um and i'll just set the scene you've got steve jobs in a in a lecture hall and wherever in in apple land and somebody asked a question about, um, you know, why um, it was a particular code base. It might have been Java. You know, why is Apple ditched Java? You know, we're going back 20 years. And, and he goes, look, um, it's just not a fit for where we're going and what we're doing, but you've got to trust us. And he starts naming some key engineers, some key developers. You've got to trust Jimmy, whatever his name is, and John and... Amanda, and you got to trust what they're doing. These are good guys. They're working hard. They're rebuilding the code base. We are bringing the product back to where you are going to find what you need to deliver. Uh, and, you know, he's talking to a developer conference. It's, and what he's really saying is hang in there, like join us, stick with us. It's not right yet, but we're getting there. And one of the things I've always found is that You've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to try to sell it. And I've made this mistake probably more than anybody else in this room. And I've got the scar tissue to prove it. And I know that it's the case. And as we have tried to come up with a strategy and a vision for Apple, It started with what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? Not not starting with, let's sit down with the engineers and and figure out what awesome technology we have and then how are we going to market that. 
Um, and I think that's the right path to take. Uh, and that's market fit stage. That's, uh, so organizations, you've got to remember, organizations go back through these stages. Um, yeah. they, they, they go up and down this curve. They go through cycles. And, and so you know, he, he was clearly a leader who had been through that cycle more than once, knew what it took, and was bringing his inspirational leadership skills to journeying people through the market fit, existing customers as well as existing employees. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, that's awesome. The persistent leader, Stu. It's the second part of our growth stages, uh, identity, finding market fit. Uh, and that's, this is where we actually start to learn to lead others. Um, our must-do actions are that we establish the guiding vision, purpose, principles, value proposition of the organization. And some of the rewards that we get to experience are finding organizational purpose, vision affirmation, clarity of identity, value creation, just rattling these off off the top of my head. Mm. Risks would be um, fear of failure, inaction, arrogance, not listening, and our learning outcomes, problem solve well, team discipline, customer insight, goal management. That is the persistent leader in a nutshell. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, and I've got a uh, couple of last yeah. words of advice. Okay, throw some, throw some in there. Um, uh, you will feel the loneliness of leadership most yes. evident during this stage. Uh, and, and I think um, what you need to do is you need to find one or two or three other leaders who are in it or have been through it. Um, and you've got to say, man, I just I want to have a cup of coffee with you every week or two, or can we, you know, jump on Slack together? Like, I'm just, this is where we're at. We're finding market fit. And, you know, it could be three months. It could be nine months. I don't know. But can you just, you know, journey with me on this? Um, mm. Because this, you know, we, we, we'll definitely touch on this. The, um, John, I, I love John Maxwell. I've quoted him too much in the last couple of episodes. Uh, better start reading some other books. Um, but I love his brutal reaction to the loneliness of leadership because we all feel it in leadership and it's, and it's there. But he goes, if you're feeling the loneliness of leadership, then you are not leading well. Yeah, right. And he actually throws it back onto the leader saying, you're at fault here, uh, which is um, not common. I've heard too many world-class leaders talk about the loneliness of leadership and kind of fall into a bit of victimhood around this. And, and I love Maxwell because he just calls a spade a spade and he goes, if you're feeling the loneliness of leadership, then you're not leading well. You actually need – it means you're not journeying together. You're not sharing the load together. And, and so you've done something wrong in your leadership. And so I think, uh, you know, and I, I, I don't know when I heard that some time ago, and it, and it really hit me going, yeah, yeah, just you, you cannot, you've got to own it. You've got to own this moment. And if you're feeling the loneliness of leadership, you've got to stick your hand up and you've got to say, hey, team, let's work on this together. Or, hey, other leader, let's work on this together because yeah. you're not leading yourself well. Something's gone wrong in that first stage. You've, you've got to go, ah, I'm not leading myself well. I haven't put the right people around me if I'm feeling that loneliness of leadership. And, and if you're listening to this today going, yeah, I have the loneliness of leadership, okay, go and stand in front of the mirror, take a good, long, hard look at yourself and go, okay, this is what I've got to do to improve. I've got to put one or two or three other people around me. I've got to have that humility. That makes sense? Yeah, brutal. Thank you, Stu. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Hey, um, next episode. We're going to talk about what it looks like after you find market fit. Um, yeah, it, it's simple. It's just kicking back in like bath, <laughs> bathtubs so of cash, you know, so easy drinking champagne, <laughs> hanging out with celebrities and rock stars on private jets. You know, it's, it's just. <laughs> yeah, that's the space where we uh, start to make business improvement. <laughs> business as usual. If you're, if you're kicking back on private jets with loads of cash. Yeah, nah, that's not true. <laughs> Oh, now I have to say our catch line twice. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I might just finish it like that with like a... <laughs> okay. I'm good with that. That's All great. Right. Talk, talk to you next time.